But what's it all mean for the other 8 billion people that are staying at home at the moment? And where's the connection? I'm really trying to explain the benefits to the population of the planet, why it's so fascinatingly interesting for people to move the technology forwards and go into space. Just, yeah. Or your preamble, yeah. that would be similar to my own, the value to people, the 7 billion plus of us here on earth should drive more of what we do is my friend premise as well. We keep trying to convince them that what we used to do was exciting and we should do more listening about the things they care about and show them how our activities in space can provide real value to things they care about. The space program, at least to the extent of the United States it is funded by the public, is here as a tool for the public. We don't have NASA and then try to convince people to. In the 60s, we created it because it could fulfill a purpose that we had, which was demonstrating that democracies were the right institutions to best advance society. And beating the Soviet Union in space became the human space flight mantra. So we can hardly question why people coming up today don't see when we're just basically trying to redo that, the value in it. I think I too have children in their 20s and for the most part, while they grew up with space and see the value because they had no choice with being my children, but they yeah. highlight and support the things that best connect to what we are doing of value here on earth. A lot of that being climate related. So sending people to Mars, they think will be great and interesting and exciting and lift people up, but really it's the opportunity cost. So if we're doing that with technology from the 1970s, that's not going to be as helpful as the programs we had in the early years. If we are doing that with only billionaires, that's a whole nother question. So we've added a lot of different ways to address the issue, but we haven't really solved it. Do you see us bringing that into the, the education programs and the school programs, or have we still got a lot of work to do? It's again, not the right way to look at it. I think as the costs come down and more people find valuable things to do in space, and that helps our economy, and that helps our national security, and that brings us new knowledge and technologies that can advance humanity's ability to live and work together here and beyond, that will resonate, but we haven't been doing things in that way. We have been spending in the United States case, and I were the only ones really doing it besides China and Russia, spending a billion dollars yeah. of taxpayer money for every astronaut sent. Sure, that resonates as probably not the smartest thing to do <laughs> with our taxpayer money. So I was focused on bringing that cost down from being able to justify our programs in ways that actually address current societal needs, not just a dream that our generation had before us. When did you first engage with space? What was it actually when you were working with, with John Glenn? Or, or was that the first time that you engaged with it? Or did you have a an empathy for it prior to that? I don't have much of a memory of the early days of Apollo like boys my age did. I worked for John Glenn for reasons unrelated to space, but because of working for him, I started meeting people involved in the space program and got a job at the National Space Society. There was when I first started resonating with what we were doing and recognizing its value and how it could be utilized to help advance society in meaningful ways. I then got a master's in science technology policy with a focus on space policy and went to NASA for the first time in 1996 and ran the policy office for our U.S. space agency for the for around five years at that time. And you weren't a Trekkie or a kind of a space nerd when you were a kid? For me, I was seven when Star Trek was canceled, but I became close with Gene Roddenberry and I talk in the book quite a bit about Star Trek and its vision and how that connected with society. His middle name, Gene Wesley Roddenberry, and one of my children, I named Wesley. Gene died while I was expecting him. And Gene had told me he created the character, Wesley Crusher, to be what he would consider the perfect son. 
And so I asked Majel Roddenberry, his widow, if we could name him Wesley, and she thought that Gene would be thrilled. So I have a deep connection to Star Trek, but um, not from when I was seven. I know that you did at one point try and get actually into space yourself. Do you think you'll ever get there? I guess I do believe I will eventually go to space, even if it's on one of these shorter suborbital flights. I did not grow up, as I said, wanting to be an astronaut, believing that was a part of my future. But having this 35 year career in it, you can't help but recognize how, for me, the most important and valuable thing I would like to do in space is, of course, view the earth as a globe as a planet experiencing weightlessness would be fun too but i've mainly focused on opening space making it more accessible for people and activities that have broader meaning for your children do they have any interest in getting into space i would say that it is not a focus of either of them my other one has yeah. a science background his degrees in environmental biology, evolutionary yeah. biology, that is, of course, got some ties to space. They too would probably say they will probably go in their lifetimes. And I think they would go if the trips become something more manageable financially, but the, it is not their driven purpose as well. Of everyone in our family, I think my husband's probably the most excited about personally going to space and probably if I got some windfall I'd have to send him. What sort of numbers do you think will actually end up in space in the next 50, 100 years? What's your gut feel for how many people will end up actually living in space for at least some extended period? Well it really is impossible to know. I will say that we tend to overestimate what can happen in the way of technological advancements over the shorter term in the like decade time frame. But over periods like 50 years, we tend to underestimate what can be accomplished because we miss large leaps. So for space travel and living in space, there are some technological things that if they happen like advanced propulsion where you could go faster to get to more habitable planets, like things about human biology, where we could survive better, that would really change the proposition. I think at current technologies, it is certainly possible to take large amounts of people to the moon and Mars. The question would be, why? What do people do when they get there? Who pays for it? Except how quickly our life expectancy has increased just over the last century. So that mm. is very likely if we yeah. keep on a positive trajectory. So what would you say is the, the biggest new news that's around at the moment that's intriguing you? Web Telescope, which here in a couple of days is gonna show us the first images it has taken it has been something even since i worked at nasa in the 90s we've been planning for a long time i've answered this question by saying finding pale blue dot orbiting a distant star where there is potentially life that remains i think something that will be just important for humanity to understand how we evolved if life exists elsewhere and do you think the James Webb will actually show us enough evidence to, to say, yeah, that we've actually got a, a very strong potential that planet or that body or in that star system could well be habitable or even well, inhabited? I, uh, what we could see will likely not be definitive, but can narrow the field of where then as technology is advanced, you can go further. When we started developing the Webb telescope, this was going to be a revolutionary technology, but we have had telescopes like Kepler who have come along since and found quite a few planets in habitable zones around different stars. It remains to be seen how definitive this information will be. Of course, we have been searching for a signature similar to our own when we truly do not know if all life forms would have a similar water, oxygen, nitrogen based life system. So these are things that some science fiction authors have gone into over our history. We are finally going to be 
discovering some of that, hopefully, for Science Fact. If there was one message that you wanted to convey to the broader humanity, what would that be? What would be the one thing that you'd love to, to get out to the broader population now? For where we are well, right now. I wrote the book Escaping Gravity because during my 35 year career, I've seen NASA, again, the preeminent space organization, perhaps the preeminent government organization in the United States, go from achieving something people thought was impossible to stagnating in some ways because human spaceflight was trying to repeat the past. And we are making strides now because we have opened the aperture and allowed more people from different backgrounds. We're teaming with the private sector who is investing their own money, and we are reducing the cost of the access to space. Again, not just for people, but for satellites and all kinds of spaceships, whether they are going to stay in low Earth orbit or go beyond. We are now developing private space stations in the United States where you can potentially use the microgravity environment of space again, to benefit us here on Earth. As those costs come, come down, it is not dissimilar to the first ocean exploration or even the first time we were able to travel through the atmosphere with powered flight. And we could not envision at the beginning of those times what the future would bring. And that is, to me, the excitement of going to space. The one thing we do know that we have learned from going to space is we turned around and we saw ourselves for the first time. Much of what we know about the planet and our changing environment is from satellites. We are able to measure and model the variation in temperature from the land, the ocean, the sea, and the atmosphere where we are going. We have for a long time had the value of weather satellites, but now being able to understand and impact, mitigate, as well as adapt to things that are happening on planet Earth that are harmful to people. We all want the same things for our families. We're both here talking about our children. We want the opportunity for them to live in a healthy world and a peaceful world. And that, I think, is something that our activities in space can prioritize and leave us all better off. I think we all need to take actions that are yeah. meaningful and really provide, yeah. recognize that our differences are less important than what we have in common. And in many ways, our Earth is our spaceship. We live on it together and we must learn to live together in order to survive so we can have the future that Gene Roddenberry and people have been excited about for so many decades. We live at an amazing time when these inventions mm. that have been brought to fore while they have caused problems, they are also offering us solutions if we can channel our energies appropriately. Do you think that the amount of kind of space debris and the, the, the satellites that are in the atmosphere at the moment is there enough work going on to clean all that up and make sure that we don't leave a, a messy trail behind us as we're it has happened typically throughout history we sometimes advance our technologies before our governance and we at this point have to catch up i think in the sense of orbital debris will become a problem undoubtedly if we don't come up with solutions, but I believe there are ways to innovate to solve this problem and at least mitigate it. I think that sustainability on Earth depends on our sustainability in space. Low Earth orbit satellites not only taught us about climate change, but that's how we communicate. We are using geopositioning satellites to measure and time where we are, all kinds of things require operational satellites in low Earth orbit. And these orbits over time will become crowded and we must solve it. I think that is critical and part of the bigger sustainable solution that space can offer us. And you think we're learning that lesson going forward. It's not a necessarily a mistake that will repeat. I hope that's going to be the situation. I'm not sure it will, but 
that is my kind of hope and desire that we'll learn from our fairly recent past and not make the same mistake again. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for spending some of your time this afternoon to just chat with me. Really appreciate it.